Coffee, Meg, and Ilk, please, by Robert Benchley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Coffee, Meg, and Ilk, please, by Robert Benchley. Give me any topic in current sociology, such as the working classes versus the working classes, or various aspects of the minimum wage, and I can talk on it with considerable confidence. I have no hesitation in putting the working man as such in his place among the hewers of wood and drawers of water, a necessary adjunct to our modern life, if you will, but of little real consequence in the big events of the world. But when I am confronted in the flesh, by the close-up of a working man with any vestige of authority however small i immediately lose my perspective and also my poise i become servile almost cringing i feel that my modest demands on his time may unless tactfully presented be offensive to him and result in something i haven't been able to analyze just what perhaps public humiliation for instance whenever i enter an elevator in a public building i am usually repeating to myself the number of the floor at which i wish to alight the elevator man gives the impression of being a social worker filling the job just for that day to help out the regular elevator man and i feel that the least i can do is to show him that i know what's what so i don't tell him my floor number as soon as i get in only elderly ladies do that i keep whispering it over to myself thinking to tell it to the world when the proper time comes but then the big question arises what is the proper time if i want to get out at the eighteenth floor should i tell him at the sixteenth or the seventeenth i decide on the sixteenth and frame my lips to say eighteen out please just why one should have to add the word out to the number of the floor is not clear when you say eighteen the obvious construction of the phrase is that you want to get out at the eighteenth floor not that you want to get in there or be let down through the flooring of the car at that point however you'll find the most sophisticated elevator riders namely messenger boys always adding the word out and it is well to follow what the messenger boys do in such matters if you don't want to go wrong so there i am mouthing the phrase eighteen out please as we shoot past the tenth eleventh twelfth thirteenth floors then i begin to get panicky supposing that i should forget my lines or that i should say them too soon or too late we are now at the fifteenth floor i clear my throat sixteen hoarsely i murmur eighteen out but at the same instant a man with a cigar in his mouth bawls seventeen out and i am not heard the car stops at seventeen and i step confidentially up to the elevator man and repeat with an attempt at nonchalance eighteen out please but just as i say the words the door clangs drowning out my request and we shoot up again i make another attempt but have become inarticulate and succeed only in making a noise like a man strangling and by this time we are at the twenty-first floor with no relief in sight shattered i retire to the back of the car and ride up to the roof and down again trying to look as if i worked in the building and had to do it however boresome it might be on the return trip i don't care what the elevator man thinks of me and tell him at every floor that i personally am going to get off at the eighteenth no matter what any one else in the car does i am dictatorial enough when i am riled it is only in the opening rounds that i hug the ropes my timidity when dealing with minor officials strikes me first in my voice i have any number of witnesses who will sign statements to the effect that my voice changed about twelve years ago and that in ordinary conversation my tone if not especially virile is at least consistent and even but when for instance i give an order at a soda fountain if the clerk overawes me at all my voice breaks into a yodel 
that makes the phrase coffee egg and milk a pretty snatch of song but practically worthless as an order if the soda counter is lined with customers and the clerks so busy tearing up checks and dropping them into the toy banks that they seem to resent any call on their drink-mixing abilities i might just as well save time and go home and shake up an egg and milk for myself for i shall not be waited on until every one else has left the counter and they are putting the nets over the caramels for the night i know that i've gone through it too many times to be deceived for there is something about the realization that i must shout out my order ahead of some one else that absolutely inhibits my shouting powers i will stand against the counter fingering my ten-cent check and waiting for the clerk to come near enough for me to tell him what i want while in the meantime ten or a dozen people have edged up next to me and given their orders received their drinks and gone away every once in a while i catch a clerk's eye and lean forward murmuring coffee but that is as far as i get some one else has shoved his way in and shouted coca-cola and i draw back to get out of the way of the vichy spray incidentally the men who push their way in and footfault on their orders always ask for coca-cola somehow it seems like painting the lily for them to order a nerve tonic i then decide that the thing for me to do is to speak up loud and act brazenly so i clear my throat and placing both hands on the counter emit what promises to be a perfect bellow coffee meg and ilk this makes just about the impression you'd think it would both on my neighbors and the clerk especially as it is delivered in a tone which ranges from a rich baritone to a rather rasping tenor at this i withdraw and go to the other end of the counter where i can begin life over again with a clean slate here perhaps i am suddenly confronted by an impatient clerk who is in a perfect frenzy to grab my check and tear it into bits to drop in his box what's yours he flings at me i immediately lose my memory and forget what it was that i wanted but here is a man who has a lot of people to wait on and who doubtless gets paid according to the volume of business he brings in i have no right to interfere with his work there is a big man edging his way beside me who is undoubtedly going to shout coca-cola in half a second so i beat him to it and say coca-cola which is probably the last drink in the store that i want to buy but it is the only thing that i can remember at the moment in spite of the fact that i have been thinking all morning how good a coffee egg and milk would taste i suppose that one of the psychological principles of advertising is to so hammer the name of your product into the mind of the timid buyer that when he is confronted by a brusque demand for an order he can't think of anything else to say whether he wants to drink it or not this dread of offending the minor official or appearing to a disadvantage before a clerk extends even to my taking nourishment i don't think that i have ever yet gone into a restaurant and ordered exactly what i wanted if only the waiter would give me the card and let me alone for say fifteen minutes as he does when i want to get him to bring me my check i could work out a meal along the lines of what i like but when he stands over me with disgusts clearly registered on his face i order the thing i like least and consider myself lucky to get out of it with so little disgrace and yet i have no doubt that if one could see him in his family life the working man is just an ordinary person like the rest of us he is probably not at all as we think of him in our dealings with him a harsh dictatorial intolerant autocrat but rather a kindly soul who likes nothing better than to sit by the fire with his children and read and he would probably be the first person to scoff at the idea that he could frighten me end of coffee megs and elk by robert benchley experiments with nettles as a substitute for cotton in world war one
from the textile world journal march 1919 confirming the fact that at the present time germany has not produced a substitute to compete successfully with cotton a chemist and inventor recently interviewed in this country brought to light a story of years of research in an endeavor to secure a fiber which might replace cotton in strength and cheapness his work has been mainly along the line of nettles and hemp and he has rather a complete line of goods representing the manufacture of fabrics from these fibers on a commercial scale attempts made in germany from time to time the textile world has been entertained by reports regarding cotton substitutes and these have increased in number during the war as the result of many and varied experiments in germany to meet the critical situation arising from the shortage of cotton from reports which have reached this country there appear to be four different products of more or less value resulting from the endeavors to replace cotton the first is textilose or paper yarn which has probably created the greatest popular interest its strength and wearing qualities however are said to be too inferior to make it a serviceable substitute for cotton proper and its use will probably be confined to a limited field such as substituting for burlap in certain instances the second fiber is cellulon a material produced in a similar manner to artificial silk wood pulp is dissolved and the resulting cellulose mass forced into threads through fine holes and then treated in various ways to procure hardness one of the methods described has been treatment in a bath of casein and then immersion in solution of formaldehyde with final treatment in a heat chamber it appears that this fiber has a future for use in substituting inferior cotton goods not submitted to heavy wear and tear nevertheless it probably will have to be confined to yarns of low count ten singles being mentioned as the limit another class of substitutes tried in germany consists of fibrous materials such as obtained from the typha plant known in america as cattail or reed mace these appear to be of very little value for spinning by themselves on account of the shortness of the fibers but may be serviceable with mixtures of longer staples the fourth and last class is nettle fibers germany has apparently not yet produced an economical and serviceable fiber from this plant problems connected with the growing of the nettles and their cultivation together with more complicated ones related to the decortication and degumming of the fibers obtained do not appear to have been successfully resolved the nettle plants it is along this line that the chemist referred to above has devoted most of his attention the use of nettles is a revival of olden times as nettle fibers were at one time largely used for homespun fabrics distinguished by excellent strength and wearing qualities china still uses the fibers of bochmeria nivea a species of the nettle family for the production of the so-called grass cloth a durable fabric made by hand while the nettle fiber cannot be considered as a general substitute for cotton it can be used for certain counts of yarn intended for special fabrics it is stated that no attempts should be made to use this fiber for higher counts than 24 singles as nettle fibers are of a heavier body than cotton and have a limit for use for spinning high counts above 24 singles the production of a regular and even yarn is somewhat problematical nettle fibers should be preserved for special purposes where excellent wearing qualities count and spinning over 20 is not required cloths in which it is especially useful are tropical cloth toweling etc 
it would further replace cotton to advantage in the manufacture of half woolen goods cloth blankets hosiery etc and also in cases where heretofore china and peruvian cotton was required there are many varieties of nettles which may be used interchangeably and it is stated that practically no difference in the fiber from these varied species can be noted or at least no more than might occur between different fibers from the same species this country offers the opportunity of growing any of the following varieties bochmeria urtica gracilis dioica laportia canadensis parietaria experiments in southern germany have been mostly with urtica dioica the plant requires a soil rich in nitrogen and with some moisture consequently the great tracts of land in the everglades section of florida are considered ideal for nettle cultivation successful cultivation of the nettle plant has been carried on in staten island by the chemist interviewed and he states that he has obtained two crops a year he believes that three crops can be grown in the southern states the nettle plant has as a by-product an excellent cattle fodder in its leaves containing 25 percent of protein consequently the cost of production can be cut down by the utilization of this food obtaining the fiber nettle stalks cannot be retted in the manner of hemp and flax the inventor referred to above has worked out a method of treatment which has given satisfaction the best time to cut the plant for production of fiber is when it first starts to blossom stalks are then placed in a decorticating machine for the separation of the wood from the fiber the latter is then treated chemically in order to remove the natural oils gums etc and to separate the individual fibers in this process the fibers are boiled under pressure with a chemical solution after coming from this treatment they are run under corrugated rollers for preliminary pulling apart and are then carded in the regular way spinning may be done on the standard machinery used for cotton illustrative samples demonstrating the whole process in its entirety allow the following conclusions nettle fibers may be produced in strictly ultimate elements in length from two to six inches such fibers are easily turned into yarns of different kinds regular and even of good tensile strength fabrics made from such yarns make a good showing the fibers mix readily with wool garments made from nettle cloth white and dyed for men's wear tropical garments etc demonstrate the excellent wearing quality of such cloth after years of heavy wear and tear it is claimed that a clean nettle fiber ready for spinning may be produced to sell with a profit of seven cents per pound end of experiments with nettles as a substitute for cotton in world war one from the textile world journal march 1919 read for librivox by sue anderson letter by an american officer by anonymous this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I am writing you a few lines to say that I am assigned with a company to two French companies to defend an important position, Hill, against the expected German offense. My company will be in the first position to resist the tremendous concentration against us, and I do not believe there is a chance of any of us surviving the first rush. I am proud to be trusted with such a post of honor and have the greatest confidence in my own men to do their duty to the end. My company 
is expected to protect the right flank of the position and to counterattack at sight of the first Bosch. In war, some units have to be sacrificed for the safety of the rest, and this post has fallen to us and will be executed gladly as one contribution to the final victory. I want you in case I am killed to be brave and remember that one could not have wished a better way to die than for a righteous cause and one's country. End of letter by an American officer by Anonymous. Read by Helen Z. Ferrara. The Book of Matthew, Chapter 25, from the World English Bible. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Book of Matthew, Chapter 25, by World English Bible. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Those who were foolish when they took their lamps took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept, but at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Annotation The end of the wick of an oil lamp needs to be cut off periodically to avoid having it become clogged with carbon deposits. The wick height is also adjusted so that the flame burns evenly and gives good light without producing a lot of smoke. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, What if there isn't enough for us and you? You go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. While they went away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards the other virgins also came, all saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Most certainly, I tell you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For it is like a man going into another country who called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on his journey. Immediately, he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. In like manner, he also who got the two gained another two. But he who received the one went away and dug in the earth and hid his lord's money. Now, after a long time, the lord of those servants came and reconciled accounts with them. He who received the five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Behold, I have gained another five talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who got the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Behold, I have gained another two talents besides them. His Lord said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you that you are a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter. I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the earth. Behold, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow, and gather where I didn't scatter. 
you ought therefore to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming i should have received back my own with interest take away therefore the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents for to every one who has will be given and he will have abundance but from him who doesn't have even that which he has will be taken away throw out the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory before him all the nations will be gathered and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then the king will tell those on his right hand come blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world for i was hungry and you gave me food to eat i was thirsty and you gave me drink i was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me i was sick and you visited me i was in prison and you came to me then the righteous will answer him saying lord when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink when did we see you as a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you the king will answer them most certainly i tell you inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers annotation the word for brothers here may be also correctly translated brothers and sisters or siblings you did it to me then he will say also to those on the left hand depart from me you cursed into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels for i was hungry and you didn't give me food to eat i was thirsty and you gave me no drink i was a stranger and you didn't take me in naked and you didn't clothe me sick and in prison and you didn't visit me then they will also answer saying lord when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't help you then he will answer them saying most certainly i tell you inasmuch as you didn't do it to one of the least of these you didn't do it to me these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life end of book of matthew chapter twenty five by world english bible journal of the american institute of homeopathy volume eleven july nineteen eighteen to june nineteen nineteen general practice new faces for old one phase of reconstruction this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. just behind the far-flung battle lines in france stretching far rearward to Brittany and southward to the sunny riviera american red cross hospitals and convalescent homes dot the french map they shift daily sometimes in an hour as the swing of war sends the allies forward toward the rhine base hospitals in and about paris accommodate more than seven thousand evacuation and front-line hospitals can care for all the thousands the gods of war may throw into them dispensaries diet kitchens and infirmaries run by the red cross are located all over france it is part of the red cross service for humanity convalescent houses are located at baritz cannes becheville st cloud margot le quasi Isundun, and chateau terry but humanitarian as all this is there is another phase of red cross work fully as interesting and in a way more vital to the future the man who loses a leg or an arm or even his sight 
may go about in comparative happiness and content. But the man whose lower jaw is shot away, whose face is so disfigured that his fellow beings turn away in horror, tinge with pity, that is the man for whom the Red Cross, aided by a noble woman, is doing the best work of all. It is literally a case of new faces for old. Supreme art, mechanical genius, and twenty dollars supplied by the American people and spent by the Red Cross furnish the new face. It sounds simple, and it is, but its consequences are wonderful beyond words, which only those who have seen the mutilated before and after wearing these masks can understand. To begin at the beginning, an English sculptor, Captain Derwent Wood, conceived the idea of replacing non-existing tissue and missing parts with masks to resemble the victim of war as he appeared before being wounded. The work was perfected by Mrs. Maynard Ladd, another sculptor, who is devoting all her time in Paris to replacing mutiles as the French call them. This soldier's face was terribly mutilated in the war. Mrs. Ladd, the sculptress, working under the American Red Cross, after making a study of him, has a mask which covers the lower part of his face, thus hiding his terrible injuries. French soldier, whose face was mutilated in the war, wearing the artificial chin made by Madame Ladd of the American Red Cross. Three masks made by Mrs. Ladd for men with face mutilations. The masks are cast in thin copper according to a plaster model made from photographs, then covered with a silver deposit and painted to resemble flesh. Mrs. Anna Coleman Ladd and Mr. Cauldron, Mrs. A. Coleman Ladd working on a portrait mask. The method is also simple. When the mutile is nursed back to health, and his wounds are thoroughly healed, and the tissue and muscle have finished contracting, he goes to Mrs. Ladd's studio, where she takes a plaster cast of the mutilated features. Then she takes a photograph of her subject as he appeared before mutilation. From this she shapes a mask to fit the mutilated face taken in plaster replica. Then a very thin mask of copper plated with silver is made. If eyebrows are missing, they are inserted in the mask. If a mustache adorned the original face, a mustache is added. Sometimes, when the eyelids have been destroyed, artificial eyes with openings in them for the pupils of the wearer are made. Every conceivable mutilation of the face has been handled successfully. When the mask is completed, the mutile goes for a fitting. The mask is held in place by fake eyeglasses, by a wig, in a manner not easily discernible. The mask is fitted and then the artist comes into action. Mrs. Ladd paints the masks the exact color of the mutile's face. The illusion is perfect. The man no longer a mutile can smoke and talk. He is a human being again. He no longer fears to walk the streets. People no longer gaze on him in pity, scarcely disguising horror and aversion. The transformation is complete at a cost of $20 and the art and devotion of a woman. The Red Cross has much other work to do in the service of humanity. By the end of this year, it will have spent more than $71 million in France and $20 million in Italy. To continue this work for humanity, 
His service for all peoples in all climes, the Red Cross must have the united support of the American people. With this end in view, the second annual Christmas Roll Call will come the week of December 16th to the 23rd. Last year's record was the signature of 22 million adults and 8 million children pledged to sustain the flag. We hope the Christmas Roll Call of 1919 will break this record. End of New Faces for Old, read by Helen Z. Barrara. Armistice Day, Spirit and Significance of Armistice Day, 1927. A non-denominational prayer for Armistice Day from the Soldiers and Sailors Prayer Book of the Jewish Welfare Board. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. O God, who art full of compassion, who dwellest on high, grant perfect rest beneath the shelter of thy divine presence in the exalted places among the holy and pure, who shine as of the brightness of the firmament to all who have bravely laid down their lives for their country. We beseech thee, Lord, of compassion, shelter them forevermore under the cover of thy wings, and let their souls be bound up in the bond of eternal life with the souls of righteousness who are ever with thee, and the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Amen. End of a non-denominational prayer for Armistice Day Read by Helen Z. Ferrara Photographing Snowflakes by Wilson A. Bentley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2018 Photographing Snowflakes by Wilson A. Bentley from the Popular Mechanics Magazine, Volume 37, February 1922. Every snowflake has an infinity of beauty which is enhanced by the knowledge that the investigator will, in all probability, never find another exactly like it. Consequently, photographing these transient forms of nature gives to the worker something of the spirit of a discoverer. Besides combining her greatest skill and artistry in the production of snowflakes, nature generously fashions the most beautiful specimens on a very thin plane so that they are specially adapted for photomicrographical study. The photographing of snowflakes, although quite delicate work, can hardly be called difficult, although some hardships attend it, because the work must all be done in a temperature below freezing and under conditions of much physical exposure. The temperature at which photography is possible depends somewhat upon the thickness of the crystals. This varies greatly from time to time and depends upon whether the temperature is rising from an intense degree of cold or falling from a point above freezing. If rising after a cold snap, Photographing can often be continued until actual thawing commences. Of course, 
location is everything in this work and no one except those living in arctic climates or in regions having long and severe winters can accomplish very much generally speaking the western quadrants of widespread storms or blizzards furnish the most beautiful and perfect forms at such times the wind is usually westerly or northerly with the barometer standing at 29.6 to 29.9 inches and slowing rising. The percentage of perfect crystals is likely to be larger when the snowfall is not too thick and heavy, with the crystals medium to small in size rather than large. The character of the snowfall often undergoes quite abrupt changes as a storm progresses. The apparatus required for snowflake photography consists of a compound microscope fitted with a joint that permits the instrument to be turned down horizontally at right angles to its base so that it can be coupled to a camera bellows by means of a light tight connection. The microscope objectives are used alone without the eyepiece. It is best to have several different objectives, one half, three quarters and three inch combinations which give magnifications of from eight to sixty diameters sixty four to three thousand six hundred times will serve well ordinary daylight coming through a window is used for illuminating the crystal after it has been placed on a microscope slide a tiny beam of light entering through the small aperture in the substage of the instrument the apparatus is placed indoors, nearby and facing a window. The room, the apparatus and its accessories should always be away from any source of artificial heat and at a temperature approximately that of the outside air. The necessary accessories are an observation microscope, a pair of thick mittens, microscope slides, a sharp pointed wooden splint, a feather, and a turkey wing or similar duster also an extra focusing bag for the camera containing clear glass instead of the usual ground glass with a magnifying lens attached this is used for final focusing a blackboard about one feet square with stiff wire or metal handles at the ends so that the hands will not touch and warm it is used to collect the specimens as it is necessary to cover the end of the microscope objective with a strip of black card that takes the place of the usual camera shutter which controls the duration of exposure it is necessary to fit two vertical rods at each side of the microscope tube to hold the card the snowflakes are caught on the blackboard as they fall and examined by the naked eye or with the assistance of a hand magnifying glass the feather duster is used to brush the board clean every few seconds until two or more promising specimens alight upon it when it is immediately removed indoors from this point onward the photographer must work fast the promising specimens are placed for a moment's observation under the observation microscope the removal of the snowflake from the board to the microscope slide is accomplished with the sharp pointed splint which is pressed gently against the face of the crystal until the latter adheres to it so that it can be picked up and placed on the glass slide usually several crystals are placed together on a single slide a momentary glance being given to each and care taken while doing this not to breathe on the crystals the utmost haste must be used for a snow crystal is often exceedingly tiny and frequently not thicker than heavy paper. Furthermore, once these bits of pure beauty are isolated, evaporation, not melting, soon wears them away, so that, even in zero weather, they last but a very few minutes. When a desirable specimen is obtained, it is pressed flat against the glass with the edge of the feather and the slide inserted in the stage of the microscope on the camera stand, centered, roughly focused with the camera ground glass then sharply focused with the clear glass screen and magnifier focusing on some tiny air tube near the center of the crystal the plate holder is then inserted into the camera the objective covered with the black card 
and the slide removed from the plate holder. The objective is then uncovered, and when the exposure, which may vary from 8 seconds to 100 or more, is deemed sufficient, the operation is reversed. Naturally enough, no rule for the length of exposure can be given, except that the greater the magnification, the longer the exposure should be. The frail, feathery flakes are the most difficult to photograph, and it is always best to place five or six other crystals around the specimen, as this greatly retards the evaporation of the central one. When working from the rear of the camera, and the bellows extension is such as to make it impossible to reach the focusing screw on the microscope, an arrangement similar to that shown in the page illustration can be used. This consists of a cord that runs over a wheel on each side of the camera and around the focusing screw. No lens is required in the camera, the microscope furnishing the optical equipment for projecting the images onto the sensitized plates. Having recorded the fleeting substance of the snowflakes on the photographic negative and brought out the image by development, the photographer discovers that the body of the snow crystal is so transparent that it does not contrast enough with its background to make a print in which the form will stand out in relief. There is no purely photographic method for producing the white images against a dark background, and yet it is necessary to do so if the images are to be appreciated by most people, whose ideal of snow is that of immaculate whiteness. The only effective method of accomplishing this result is what is known among photographers as blocking out. The negative is supported on an ordinary retoucher's desk, which may be merely a piece of glass, arranged to hold the negative so that the image is illuminated by transmitted light. Then, with an etching knife or other fine, sharp-pointed tool, the operator proceeds to scrape away the emulsion around the outline of the crystal to leave it standing alone against a background of clear glass. This requires considerable patience, and often considerable time as well. In order to avoid irreparably spoiling the original negative, it is best not to alter it in any way, but to make a copy negative on which the actual blocking out is done. After the negative has been thus prepared, prints or lantern slides are made in the usual manner. Blocking out the negatives is done indoors instead of outdoors as shown by the photograph, which was thus taken to get sufficient light to allow the exposure to be made. End of Photographing Snowflakes by Wilson A. Bentley Preliminary Expectoration Part 1 by Soren Kierkegaard From Fear and Trembling Published in 1843 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An old saying derived from the world of experience has it that he who will not work shall not eat. But, strange to say, this does not hold true in the world where it is thought applicable. For in the world of matter, the law of imperfection prevails and we see again and again that he also who will not work has bread to eat indeed that he who sleeps has a greater abundance of it than he who works in the world of matter everything belongs to whosoever happens to possess it it is thrall to the law of indifference and he who happens to possess the ring also has the spirit of the ring at his beck and call whether now he be nuruddin or aladdin and he who controls the treasures of this world controls them howsoever he managed to do so it is different in the world of spirit there an eternal and divine order obtains there the rain does not fall on the just and the unjust alike nor does the sun shine on the good and the evil alike 
but there the saying does hold true that he who will not work shall not eat and only he who was troubled shall find rest and only he who descends into the nether world shall rescue his beloved and only he who unsheathes his knife shall be given isaac again there he who will not work shall not eat but shall be deceived as the gods deceived orpheus with an immaterial figure instead of his beloved eurydice deceived him because he was lovesick and not courageous deceived him because he was a player on the cythera rather than a man there it avails not to have an abraham for one's father or to have seventeen ancestors but in that world the saying about israel's maidens will hold true of him who will not work he shall bring forth wind but he who will work shall give birth to his own father there is a kind of learning which would presumptuously introduce into the world of spirit the same law of indifference under which the world of matter groans it is thought that to know about great men and great deeds is quite sufficient and that other exertion is not necessary and therefore this learning shall not eat but shall perish of hunger while seeing all things transformed into gold by its touch and what forsooth does this learning really know there were many thousands of contemporaries and countless men in after times who knew all about the triumphs of miltiades but there was only one whom they rendered sleepless there have existed countless generations that knew by heart word for word the story of abraham but how many has it rendered sleepless now the story of abraham has the remarkable property of always being glorious in however limited a sense it is understood still here also the point is whether one means to labor and exert oneself now people do not care to labor and exert themselves but wish nevertheless to understand the story they extol abraham but how by expressing the matter in the most general terms and saying the great thing about him was that he loved god so ardently that he was willing to sacrifice to him his most precious possession that is very true but the most precious possession is an indefinite expression as one's thoughts and one's mouth run on one assumes in a very easy fashion the identity of isaac and the most precious possession and meanwhile he who is meditating may smoke his pipe and his audience comfortably stretch out their legs if the rich youth whom christ met on his way had sold all his possessions and given all to the poor we would extol him as we extol all that is great i would not understand even him without labor and yet would he never have become an abraham notwithstanding his sacrificing the most precious possessions he had that which people generally forget in the story of abraham is his fear and anxiety for as regards money one is not ethically responsible for it whereas for his son a father has the highest and most sacred responsibility however fear is a dreadful thing for timorous spirits so they omit it and yet they wish to speak of abraham so they keep on speaking and in the course of their speech the two terms isaac and the most precious thing are used alternately and everything is in the best order but now suppose that among the audience there was a man who suffered with sleeplessness and then the most terrible and profound the most tragic and at the same time the most comic misunderstanding is within the range of possibility that is 
suppose this man goes home and wishes to do as did abraham for his son is his most precious possession if a certain preacher learned of this he would perhaps go to him he would gather up all his spiritual dignity and exclaim thou abominable creature thou scum of humanity what devil possessed thee to wish to murder thy son and this preacher who had not felt any particular warmth nor perspired while speaking about abraham this preacher would be astonished himself at the earnest wrath with which he poured forth his thunders against that poor wretch indeed he would rejoice over himself for never had he spoken with such power and unction and he would have said to his wife i am an orator the only thing i have lacked so far was the occasion last sunday when speaking about abraham i did not feel thrilled in the least now if this same orator had just a bit of sense to spare i believe he would lose it if the sinner would reply in a quiet and dignified manner why it was on this very same matter you preached last sunday but however could the preacher have entertained such thoughts still such was the case and the preacher's mistake was merely not knowing what he was talking about ah would that some poet might see his way clear to prefer such a situation to the stuff and nonsense of which novels and comedies are full for the comic and the tragic here run parallel to infinity the sermon probably was ridiculous enough in itself but it became infinitely ridiculous through the very natural consequence it had or suppose now the sinner was converted by this lecture without daring to raise any objection and this zealous divine now went home elated glad in the consciousness of being effective not only in the pulpit but chiefly and with irresistible power as a spiritual guide inspiring his congregation on sunday whilst on monday he would place himself like a cherub with flaming sword before the man who by his action tried to give the lie to the old saying that the course of the world follows not the priest's word if on the other hand the sinner were not convinced of his error his position would become tragic he would probably be executed or else sent to the lunatic asylum at any rate he would become a sufferer in this world but in another sense i should think that abraham rendered him happy for he who labors he shall not perish now how shall we explain the contradiction contained in that sermon is it due to abraham's having the reputation of being a great man so that whatever he does is great but if another should undertake to do the same it is a sin a heinous sin if this be the case i prefer not to participate in such thoughtless laudations if faith cannot make it a sacred thing to wish to sacrifice one son then let the same judgment be visited on abraham as on any other man and if we perchance lack the courage to drive our thoughts to the logical conclusion and to say that abraham was a murderer then it were better to acquire that courage rather than to waste one's time on undeserved encomiums the fact is the ethical expression for what abraham did is that he wanted to murder isaac the religious that he wanted to sacrifice him but precisely in this contradiction is contained the fear which may well rob one of one's sleep and yet abraham were not abraham without this fear or again supposing abraham did not do what is attributed to him if his action was an entirely different one based on conditions of those times then let us forget him for what is the use of calling to mind that past which can no longer become a present reality or the speaker had perhaps forgotten the essential fact that isaac was the son 
for if faith is eliminated having been reduced to a mere nothing then only the brutal fact remains that abraham wanted to murder isaac which is easy for everybody to imitate who has not the faith the faith that is which renders it most difficult for him love has its priests in the poets and one hears at times a poet's voice which worthily extols it but not a word does one hear of faith who is there to speak in honour of that passion philosophy goes right on theology sits at the window with a painted visage and sues for philosophy's favour offering it her charms it is said to be difficult to understand the philosophy of hegel but to understand abraham why that is an easy matter to proceed further than hegel is a wonderful feat but to proceed further than abraham why nothing is easier personally i have devoted a considerable amount of time to a study of hegelian philosophy and believe i understand it very well in fact i am rash enough to say that when notwithstanding an effort i am not able to understand him in some passages it is because he is not entirely clear about the matter himself all this intellectual effort i perform easily and naturally and it does not cause my head to ache on the other hand whenever i attempt to think about abraham i am as it were overwhelmed at every moment i am aware of the enormous paradox which forms the content of abraham's life at every moment i am repulsed and my thought notwithstanding its passionate attempts cannot penetrate into it cannot forge on the breath of a hair i strain every muscle in order to envisage the problem and become a paralytic in the same moment i am by no means unacquainted with what has been admired as great and noble my soul feels kinship with it being satisfied in all humility that it was also my cause the hero espoused and when contemplating his deed i say to myself jean tour cousa augutur footnote your cause too is at stake End of footnote i am able to identify myself with the hero but i cannot do so with abraham for whenever i have reached his height i fall down again since he confronts me as the paradox it is by no means my intention to maintain that faith is something inferior but on the contrary that it is the highest of all things also that it is dishonest in philosophy to offer something else instead and to pour scorn on faith but it ought to understand its own nature in order to know what it can offer it should take away nothing least of all fool people out of something as if it were of no value i am not unacquainted with the sufferings and dangers of life but i do not fear them and cheerfully go forth to meet them but my courage is not for all that the courage of faith and is as nothing compared with it i cannot carry out the movement of faith i cannot close my eyes and confidently plunge into the absurd it is impossible for me but neither do i boast of it now i wonder if every one of my contemporaries is really able to perform the movements of faith unless i am much mistaken they are rather inclined to be proud of making what they perhaps think me unable to do namely the imperfect movement it is repugnant to my soul to do what is so often done to speak inhumanly about great deeds as if a few thousands of years were an immense space of time i prefer to speak about them in a human way and as though they had been done but yesterday and to let the great deed itself be the distance which either inspires or condemns me 
now if i in the capacity of tragic hero for a higher flight i am unable to take if i had been summoned to such an extraordinary royal progress as was the one on mount moriah i know very well what i would have done i would not have been craven enough to remain at home neither would i have dawdled on the way nor would i have forgot my knife just to draw out the end a bit but i am rather sure that i would have been promptly on the spot with everything in order in fact would probably have been there before the appointed time so as to have the business soon over with but i also know what i would have done besides in the moment i mounted my horse i would have said to myself now all is lost god demands isaac i shall sacrifice him and with him all my joy but for all that god is love and will remain so for me for in this world god and i cannot speak together we have no language in common possibly one or the other of my contemporaries will be stupid enough and jealous enough of great deeds to wish to persuade himself and me that if i had acted thus i should have done something even greater than what abraham did for my sublime resignation was he thinks by far more ideal and poetic than abraham's literal-minded action and yet this is absolutely not so for my sublime resignation was only a substitute for faith i could not have made more than the infinite movement of resignation to find myself and again repose in myself nor would i have loved isaac as abraham loved him the fact that i was resolute enough to resign is sufficient to prove my courage in a human sense and the fact that i loved him with my whole heart is the very presupposition without which my action would be a crime but still i did not love as did abraham for else i would have hesitated even in the last moment without for that matter arriving too late on mount moriah also i would have spoiled the whole business by my behavior for if i had had isaac restored to me i would have been embarrassed that which was an easy matter for abraham would have been difficult for me i mean to rejoice again in isaac for he who with all the energy of his soul proprio motu et proprius auspices footnote by his own impulse and on his own responsibility and footnote has made the infinite movement of resignation and can do no more he will retain possession of isaac only in his sorrow but what did abraham he arrived neither too early nor too late he mounted his ass and rode slowly on the way and all the while he had faith believing that god would not demand isaac of him though ready all the while to sacrifice him should it be demanded of him he believed this on the strength of the absurd for there was no question of human calculation any longer and the absurdity consisted in god's who yet made this demand of him recalling his demand the very next moment abraham ascended the mountain and whilst the knife already gleamed in his hand he believed that god would not demand isaac of him he was to be sure surprised at the outcome but by a double movement he had returned at his first state of mind and therefore received isaac back more gladly than the first time on this height then stands abraham the last stage he loses sight of is that of infinite resignation he does really proceed further he arrives at faith for all these caricatures of faith wretched lukewarm sloth which thinks oh there is no hurry it is not necessary to worry before the time comes and miserable hopefulness which says one cannot know what will happen there might perhaps 
all these caricatures belong to the sordid view of life which have already fallen under the infinite scorn of infinite resignation abraham i am not able to understand and in a certain sense i can learn nothing from him without being struck with wonder they who flatter themselves that by merely considering the outcome of abraham's story they will necessarily arrive at faith only deceive themselves and wish to cheat god out of the first movement of faith it were tantamount to deriving worldly wisdom from the paradox but who knows one or the other of them may succeed in doing this for our times are not satisfied with faith and not even with the miracle of changing water into wine they go right on changing wine into water is it not preferable to remain satisfied with faith and is it not outrageous that everyone wishes to go right on if people in our times decline to be satisfied with love as is proclaimed from various sides where will we finally land in worldly shrewdness in mean calculation in paltriness and baseness in all that which renders man's divine origin doubtful were it not better to stand fast in the faith and better that he that standeth take heed lest he fall for the movement of faith must ever be made by virtue of the absurd but note well in such wise that one does not lose the things of this world but wholly and entirely regains them end of preliminary expectoration part one by soren kierkegaard from fear and trembling published in 1843 translated by lee m hollander preliminary expectoration by soren kierkegaard from fear and trembling published in 1843 part 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. as far as i am concerned i am able to describe most excellently the movements of faith but i cannot make them myself when a person wishes to learn how to swim he has himself suspended in a swimming belt and then goes through the motions but that does not mean that he can swim in the same fashion i too can go through the motions of faith but when i am thrown into the water i swim to be sure for i am not a waiter in the shallows but i go through a different set of movements to wit those of infinity whereas faith does the opposite to wit makes the movements to regain the finite after having made those of infinite resignation blessed is he who can make these movements for he performs a marvellous feat and i shall never weary of admiring him whether now it be abraham himself or the slave in abraham's house whether it be a professor of philosophy or a poor servant girl it is all the same for me for i have regard only to the movements but these movements i watch closely and i will not be deceived whether by myself or by any one else the knights of infinite resignation are easily recognized for their gait is dancing and bold but they who possess the jewel of faith frequently deceive one because their bearing is curiously like that of a class of people heartily despised by infinite resignation as well as by faith the philistines let me admit frankly that i have not in my experience encountered any certain specimen of this type but i do not refuse to admit that as far as i know every other person may be such a specimen at the same time i will say that i have searched vainly for years 
it is the custom of scientists to travel around the globe to see rivers and mountains new stars gay-colored birds misshapen fish ridiculous races of men they abandon themselves to a bovine stupor which gapes at existence and believe that they have seen something worth while all this does not interest me but if i knew where there lived such a night of faith i would journey to him on foot for that marvel occupies my thoughts exclusively not a moment would i leave him out of sight but would watch how he makes the movements and i would consider myself provided for life and would divide my time between watching him and myself practicing the movements and would thus use all my time in admiring him as i said i have not met with such a one but i can easily imagine him here he is i make his acquaintance and am introduced to him the first moment i lay my eyes on him i push him back leaping back myself i hold up my hands in amazement and say to myself good lord that person is it really he why he looks like a parish beetle but it is really he i become more closely acquainted with him watching his every movement to see whether some trifling incongruous movement of his has escaped me some trace perchance of a signalling from the infinite a glance a look a gesture a melancholy air or a smile which might betray the presence of infinite resignation contrasting with the finite but no i examine his figure from top to toe to discover whether there be anywhere a chink through which the infinite might be seen to peer forth but no he is of a piece all through and how about his footing vigorous altogether that of finiteness no citizen dressed in his very best prepared to spend his sunday afternoon in the park treads the ground more firmly he belongs altogether to this world no philistine more so there is no trace of the somewhat exclusive and haughty demeanor which marks off the night of infinite resignation he takes pleasure in all things is interested in everything and perseveres in whatever he does with the zest characteristic of persons wholly given to worldly things he attends to his business and when one sees him one might think he was a clerk who had lost his soul in doing double bookkeeping he is so exact he takes a day off on sunday he goes to church but no hint of anything supernatural or any other sign of the incommensurable betrays him and if one did not know him it would be impossible to distinguish him in the congregation for his brisk and manly singing proves only that he has a pair of good lungs in the afternoon he walks out to the forest he takes delight in all he sees in the crowds of men and women the new omnibuses the sound if one met him on the promenade one might think he was some shopkeeper who was having a good time so simple is his joy for he is not a poet and in vain have i tried to lure him into betraying some sign of the poet's detachment toward evening he walks home again with a gait as steady as that of a mail carrier on his way he happens to wonder whether his wife will have some little special warm dish ready for him when he comes home as she surely has as for instance a roasted lamb's head garnished with greens and if he met one minded like himself he is very likely to continue talking about this dish with him till they reach the east gate and to talk about it with a zest befitting a chef as it happens he has not four shillings to spare and yet he firmly believes that his wife shirley has that dish ready for him if she has it would be an enviable sight for distinguished people and an inspiring one for common folks to see him eat for he has an appetite greater than esau's his wife has not prepared it strange he remains altogether the same
again on his way he passes a building lot and there meets another man they fall to talking and in a trice he erects a building freely disposing of everything necessary and the stranger will leave him with the impression that he has been talking with a capitalist the fact being that the night of my admiration is busy with the thought that if it really came to the point he would unquestionably have the means wherewithal at his disposal now he is lying on his elbows in the window and looking over the square on which he lives all that happens there if it be only a rat creeping in a gutter hole or children playing together everything engages his attention and yet his mind is at rest as though it were the mind of a girl of sixteen he smokes his pipe in the evening and to look at him you would swear it was the green grocer from across the street who is lounging at the window in the evening twilight thus he shows as much unconcern as any worthless happy-go-lucky fellow and yet at every moment he lives he purchases his leisure at the highest price for he makes not the least movement except by virtue of the absurd and yet yet indeed i might become furious with anger if for no other reason than that of envy and yet this man has performed and is performing every moment the movement of infinity he has resigned everything absolutely and then again seized hold of it all on the strength of the absurd but this miracle may so easily deceive one that it will be best if i describe the movements in a given case which may illustrate their aspect in contact with reality and that is the important point suppose then a young swain falls in love with a princess and all his life is bound up with this love but circumstances are such that it is out of the question to think of marrying her an impossibility to translate his dreams into reality the slaves of paltriness the frogs in the sloughs of life they will shout of course such a love is folly the rich brewer's widow is quite as good and solid a match let them but croak the knight of infinite resignation does not follow their advice he does not surrender his love not for all the riches of the world he is no fool he first makes sure that this love really is the contents of his life for his soul is too sound and too proud to waste itself on a mere intoxication he is no coward he is not afraid to let his love insinuate itself into his most secret and most remote thoughts to let it wind itself in innumerable coils about every fibre of his consciousness if he is disappointed in his love he will never be able to extricate himself again he feels a delicious pleasure in letting love thrill his every nerve and yet his soul is solemn as is that of him who has drained a cup of poison and who now feels the virus mingle with every drop of his blood poised in that moment between life and death having thus imbibed love and being wholly absorbed in it he does not lack the courage to try and dare all he surveys the whole situation he calls together his swift thoughts which like tame pigeons obey his every beck he gives the signal and they dart in all directions but when they return every one bearing a message of sorrow and explain to him that it is impossible then he becomes silent he dismisses them he remains alone and then he makes the movement now if what i say here is to have any significance it is of prime importance that the movement be made in a normal fashion the night of resignation is supposed to have sufficient energy to concentrate the entire contents of his life and the realization of existing conditions 
into one single wish but if one lacks this concentration this devotion to a single thought if his soul from the very beginning is scattered on a number of objects he will never be able to make the movement he will be as worldly wise in the conduct of his life as a financier who invests his capital in a number of securities to win on the one if he should lose on the other that is he is no knight furthermore the knight is supposed to possess sufficient energy to concentrate all his thought into a single act of consciousness if he lacks this concentration he will only run errands in life and will never be able to assume the attitude of infinite resignation for the very minute he approaches it he will suddenly discover that he forgot something so that he must remain behind the next minute thinks he it will be attainable again and so it is but such inhibitions will never allow him to make the movement but will rather tend to let him sink even deeper into the mire our knight then performs the movement which movement is he intent on forgetting the whole affair which too would presuppose much concentration no for the knight does not contradict himself and it is a contradiction to forget the main contents of one's life and still remain the same person and he has no desire to become another person neither does he consider such a desire to smack of greatness only lower natures forget themselves and become something different thus the butterfly has forgotten that it once was a caterpillar who knows but it may forget altogether that it was once a butterfly and turn into a fish deeper natures never forget themselves and never change their essential qualities so the knight remembers all but precisely this remembrance is painful nevertheless in his infinite resignation he has become reconciled with existence his love for the princess has become for him the expression of an eternal love has assumed a religious character has been transfigured into a love for the eternal being which to be sure denied him the fulfilment of his love yet reconciled him again by presenting him with the abiding consciousness of his love's being preserved in an everlasting form of which no reality can rob him now he is no longer interested in what the princess may do and precisely this proves that he has made the movement of infinite resignation correctly in fact this is a good criterion for detecting whether a person's movement is sincere or just make-believe take a person who believes that he too has resigned but lo time passed the princess did something on her part for example married a prince and then his soul lost the elasticity of its resignation this ought to show him that he did not make the movement correctly for he who has resigned absolutely is sufficient unto himself the knight does not cancel his resignation but preserves his love as fresh and young as it was at the first moment he never lets go of it just because his resignation is absolute whatever the princess does cannot disturb him for it is only the lower natures who have the law for their actions in some other person for example have the premises of their actions outside of themselves infinite resignation is the last stage which goes before faith so that every one who has not made the movement of infinite resignation cannot have faith for only through absolute resignation do i become conscious of my eternal worth and only then can there arise the problem of again grasping hold of this world by virtue of faith we will now suppose the knight of faith in the same case he does precisely as the other knight he absolutely resigns the love which is the contents of his life 
he is reconciled to the pain but then the miraculous happens he makes one more movement strange beyond comparison saying and still i believe that i shall marry her marry her by virtue of the absurd by virtue of the fact that to god nothing is impossible now the absurd is not one of the categories which belong to the understanding proper it is not identical with the improbable the unforeseen the unexpected the very moment our knight resigned himself he made sure of the absolute impossibility in any human sense of his love this was the result reached by his reflections and he had sufficient energy to make them in a transcendent sense however by his very resignation the attainment of his end is not impossible but this very act of again taking possession of his love is at the same time a relinquishment of it nevertheless this kind of possession is by no means an absurdity to the intellect for the intellect all the while continues to be right as it is aware that in the world of finalities in which reason rules his love was and is an impossibility the knight of faith realizes this fully as well hence the only thing which can save him is recourse to the absurd and this recourse he has through his faith that is he clearly recognizes the impossibility and in the same moment he believes the absurd for if he imagined he had faith without at the same time recognizing with all the passion his soul is capable of that his love is impossible he would be merely deceiving himself and his testimony would be of no value since he had not arrived even at the stage of absolute resignation this last movement the paradoxical movement of faith i cannot make whether or no it be my duty although i desire nothing more ardently than to be able to make it it must be left to a person's discretion whether he cares to make this confession and at any rate it is a matter between him and the eternal being who is the object of his faith whether an amicable adjustment can be effected but what every person can do is to make the movement of absolute resignation and i for my part would not hesitate to declare him a coward who imagines he cannot perform it it is a different matter with faith but what no person has a right to is to delude others in the belief that faith is something of no great significance or that it is an easy matter whereas it is the greatest and the most difficult of all things but the story of abraham is generally interpreted in a different way god's mercy is praised which restored isaac to him it was but a trial a trial this word may mean much or little and yet the whole of it passes off as quickly as the story is told one mounts a winged horse in the same instant one arrives on mount moriah and presto one sees the ram it is not remembered that abraham only rode on an ass which travels but slowly that it was a three days journey for him and that he required some additional time to collect the firewood to bind isaac and to wet his knife and yet one extols abraham he who is to preach the sermon may sleep comfortably until a quarter of an hour before he is to preach and the listener may comfortably sleep during the sermon for everything is made easy enough without much exertion either to preacher or listener but now suppose a man was present who suffered with sleeplessness and who went home and sat in a corner and reflected as follows the whole lasted but a minute you need only wait a little while and then the ram will be shown and the trial will be over 
now if the preacher should find him in this frame of mind i believe he would confront him in all his dignity and say to him wretched that thou art to let thy soul lapse into such folly miracles do not happen all life is a trial and as he proceeded he would grow more and more passionate and would become ever more satisfied with himself and whereas he had not noticed any congestion in his head while preaching about abraham he now feels the veins on his forehead swell yet who knows but he would stand aghast if the sinner should answer him in a quiet and dignified manner that it was precisely this about what he preached the sunday before let us then either waive the whole story of abraham or else learn to stand in awe of the enormous paradox which constitutes his significance for us so that we may learn to understand that our age like every age may rejoice if it has faith if the story of abraham is not a mere nothing an illusion or if it is just used for show and as a pastime the mistake cannot by any means be in the sinner's wishing to do likewise but it is necessary to find out how great was the deed which abraham performed in order that the man may judge for himself whether he has the courage and the mission to do likewise the comical contradiction in the procedure of the preacher was his reduction of the story of abraham to insignificance whereas he rebuked the other man for doing the very same thing but should we then cease to speak about abraham i certainly think not but if i were to speak about him i would first of all describe the terrors of his trial to that end leech-like i would suck all the suffering and distress out of the anguish of a father in order to be able to describe what abraham suffered whilst yet preserving his faith i would remind the hearer that the journey lasted three days and a goodly part of the fourth in fact these three and a half days ought to become infinitely longer than the few thousand years which separate me from abraham i would remind him as i think right that every person is still permitted to turn about before trying his strength on the formidable task in fact that he may return every instant in repentance provided this is done i fear for nothing nor do i fear to awaken great desires among people to attempt to emulate abraham but to get out a cheap edition of abraham and yet forbid every one to do as he did that i call ridiculous end of preliminary expectoration part two by soren kierkegaard from fear and trembling published in eighteen forty three translated by lee m hollander Recipes for Eat More Fresh Cranberries by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline Recipes for Eat More Fresh Cranberries 10-Minute Cranberry Sauce 2 cups sugar, 2 cups water, four cups eat more cranberries boil sugar and water together five minutes add cranberries and boil without stirring until all the skins pop open about five minutes remove from heat and cool in saucepan makes one quart ten minute cranberry sauce variations cranberry ambrosia pour sauce over thin sliced oranges Top with shredded coconut for cranberry ambrosia. Minted cranberry sauce. Stir in teaspoon chopped fresh mint or few drops mint extract for minted cranberry sauce. Cranberry apricot delight. 
Add one cup cooked, sweetened apricots for cranberry apricot delight. Cranberry Chiquita Fold in three bananas cut in one-half inch slices for cranberry chiquita. Cranberry Ruby Pears Spoon sauce over cooked or canned pear halves for cranberry ruby pears. Put some in your freezer and enjoy these appetizing fresh cranberry sauces the year round. Quick Freezing Fresh Cranberries You can enjoy the appetizing flavor of fresh cranberries the year round by putting a good supply of eat more in your home freezer or storage locker. It's the easiest fruit to freeze. No processing is required. All you have to do is place the unopened bag or box of Eat More Cranberries directly in your freezing unit. When ready to use, handle exactly as you would fresh cranberries. No thawing is required. Pour in colander, rinse in cold water, drain. Use in any standard fresh cranberry recipe. Cranberry Sherbet Two and three quarters cups water, two cups sugar, four cups eat more cranberries, one tablespoon gelatin, one quarter cup cold water, juice and grated rind one lemon, juice and grated rind one orange. Combine cranberries, water, and sugar in saucepan. Cook until cranberries are soft. Put through sieve or food mill. Soften gelatin in cold water and dissolve in hot cranberry puree. Stir in fruit juice and rind. Cool. Pour into refrigerator tray and freeze until firm. Makes one quart. Cranberry Orange Relish Two cups sugar, four cups eat more cranberries, two sun-kissed oranges, quartered and seeded. Put raw cranberries and oranges through wearing blender or food chopper. Add sugar and mix well. Chill in refrigerator a few hours before serving. Makes one quart relish. This relish will keep well in the refrigerator for several weeks. Try quick freezing cranberry orange relish. Variations Cranberry apple relish Peel, core, and dice two apples. Stir in for cranberry apple relish. Cranberry vegetable relish. Stir in one half cup each diced raw carrots and celery for cranberry vegetable relish. Cranberry citrus relish. Add one cup canned or fresh grapefruit segments for cranberry citrus relish. Spicy cranberry relish. Stir in pinch powdered cinnamon and cloves for spicy cranberry relish. Cranberry Hawaiian relish. Stir in one cup frozen, canned, or fresh diced pineapple for cranberry Hawaiian relish. You can enjoy fresh cranberry orange relish the year round by freezing a supply for later use. Cranberry Apple Pie One recipe favorite pastry two and a quarter cups sugar, one half cup water, two cups apple slices, four cups eat more cranberries, two tablespoons cornstarch, two tablespoons water. Roll out half of pastry and fit into nine inch pan. Combine sugar, water, apple slices, and eat more cranberries in saucepan. Cook until cranberries pop, about ten minutes. Make a paste of cornstarch and remaining water, stir into fruit and continue cooking until thick and clear, about five minutes. Cool and pour into pie shell. Roll out remaining pastry and cut in strips. Arrange crisscross fashion over top. Bake in 425 degree Fahrenheit oven, 25 minutes. Ideas for Christmas Trim the house in the real old-fashioned way with gay red cranberries strung with thread and needle on the Christmas tree. Alternate a piece of snowy white popcorn for contrast. Also for dangling on the green branches, 
make four-inch circlets of cranberries twisted with silver Christmas rope or tinsel strips. Make a cranberry Santa. A circle of berries on wire makes the body, and three berries make each arm and leg. A round cardboard circle topped with a paper red hat needs but a fluff of cotton whiskers to complete St. Nick. End of Recipes for Eat More Fresh Cranberries by Anonymous Scotch Cap Light Station by the Office of Statewide Cultural Programs, Alaska Division of Parks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scotch Cap Light Station, located on Unimac Island, was the first light erected on the outside coast of Alaska. Marking the inside entrance to Unimac Pass, 70 miles northeast of Dutch Harbor, Scotch Cap Light was the most southerly in Alaska. It was one of the most isolated light stations, particularly during the winter, when travel to the station by boat was often hampered by adverse weather conditions. Scotch Cap's nearest neighbor was Cape Sarachev Light Station, 22 miles to the southeast. Stories abound recounting the hardships of the Scotch Cap keepers. One keeper, for example, reportedly froze both of his hands while trying to go from the lighthouse tower to his home during a blizzard. His life was saved by a dog that led him to safety. Because of the hazardous duty at Scotch Cap, each of the three keepers received one year's vacation every four years. No families were allowed to remain at the station. Marking the southerly entrance of a natural route through the Aleutian Islands, the station is a monument to many ship disasters before and after its establishment. In 1909, the cannery supply ship Columbia was wrecked near Unimac Island. It took two weeks before a ship could relieve the lighthouse keepers of the vessel's 194 crew members. The Japanese freighter, Koshan Maru, lost in a snowstorm, ran up the beach near the light station in 1930, as one author put it, with the Scotch cap siren blowing in her ear. In 1942, the Russian freighter, Turk Seeb, was wrecked near the station, with the loss of the captain and one sailor. The 60 survivors were cared for by the lighthouse keepers for several weeks, no rescue ship being able to reach the station due to rough seas. Bids to construct Scotch Cap Lighthouse were opened on March 22, 1902. All were subsequently rejected as too expensive. The Lighthouse Board then hired laborers and purchased most of the construction materials. On June 23, 1902, the steamer Homer left Seattle for Scotch Cap with 30 workers and a doctor. Although the fog signal was placed in operation on July 15, 1903, the station was not lighted until July 18. The project was completed at a total cost of $76,571. Equipped with a third-order fixed white light, 2300 candle power, and a 10-inch air whistle fog signal, the station was located on a low bluff near the beach. The light and fog signal building was a one-story wooden octagonal structure with a pyramidal roof, from which rose an octagonal tower surmounted by a black cylindrical lantern. The height of the structure was at least 35 feet, leaving the light 90 feet above mean high water. Two oil houses, three dwellings, a barn, and a boathouse were located southwestward of the lighthouse. Later, in 1904-05, a windbreak was erected behind the fog signal building, a telephone and call bell system installed, and a handrail was placed along the roadway from the dwellings to the fog signal building. During the 1920s and 1930s, both light stations on Unimac Island underwent improvements, alterations, and finally reconstruction. In 1922-23, the U.S. Navy installed radio telephones at the stations. Five years later, new fog signal engines and compressors were placed in operation. First-class radio beacons were installed in 1930-31. Finally, in 1940, at a cost of about $150,000, 
a new concrete reinforced lighthouse and fog signal building was erected only a few yards from the original lighthouse site a concrete sea wall was also placed near the station on april first nineteen forty six at two eighteen a m disaster struck scotch cap terrific roaring from ocean heard followed immediately by terrific sea top of which rose above cliff and struck station causing considerable damages wrote the watchstander at the radio direction finding unit located on the cliff overlooking the light station the direction finding unit watchstander immediately tried to reach the light station by radio but received no reply the watch noted in the log that scotch caps light extinguished and horn silent the officer in charge of the direction finding station ordered his men to higher grounds the tsunami believed to be one hundred feet high destroyed the entire station killing all five coast guardsmen the bodies of chief boson's mate anthony lawrence pettit fireman first class jack colvin seaman first class dewey dykstra motor machinist mate second class leonard pickering and seaman first class paul james ness washed up on the beach a few days later identified only by their bridge work and jewelry the foundations of the former light and fog signal building were still visible in nineteen sixty seven shortly after the disaster a temporary unwatched electric light and a radio beacon displayed from a small white house were established at scotch cap by early nineteen fifty a new light and fog signal station was commissioned this time located on the cliff safely above the sea from a square tower fifteen feet by fifteen feet rising from the end of a flat roof rectangular twenty foot by thirty four foot one-story concrete structure an electric white light two hundred forty thousand candle power is displayed one hundred sixteen feet above water behind the lighthouse is a flat roofed oblong concrete structure presumably the keeper's quarters and loran facilities and a white quonset hut at some distance northward of the lighthouse is an unidentified two-story rectangular structure with two one-story buildings attached the lighthouse reservation includes eight thousand eight hundred fifty two acres of land in nineteen seventy one the station was automated and unmanned End of Scotch Cap Light Station by the Office of Statewide Cultural Programs, Alaska Division of Parks. Read by Phil Schampf. Self Sacrifice by Woodrow Wilson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our life is but a little span. One generation follows another very quickly. If a man with red blood in him had his choice, knowing that he must die, he would rather die to vindicate some right, unselfish to himself, than die in his bed. We are all touched with the love of the glory, which is real glory, and the only glory comes from utter self-forgetfulness and self-sacrifice. We never erect a statue to men who have not forgotten themselves and been glorified by the memory of others. This is the standard that America holds up to mankind in all sincerity and in all earnestness. End of Self-Sacrifice by Woodrow Wilson at Kansas City, February 2nd, 1916. Read by Helen Z. Ferrara. The Experiment with the Cat by Jean-Henri Favre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Experiment with the Cat from the Storybook of Science by Jean-Henri Favre. The wind blew cold and dry. The storm of the day before had brought it on. 
uncle paul took this pretext to have the kitchen stove lighted in spite of mother ambrosine's remarks who cried out at the unseasonableness of making a fire light of the stove in summer said she did one ever see the like no one but our master would have such a notion we shall be roasted uncle paul let her talk he had his own idea they sat down at the table after eating its supper the big cat never too warm settled itself on a chair by the side of the stove and soon with its back turned to the warm sheet-iron began to purr with happiness all was going as desired uncle paul's projects were taking an excellent turn there was some complaint of the heat but he took no notice ah do you think it is for you the stove is lighted said he to the children undeceive yourselves my little friends it is for the cat the cat alone it is so chilly poor thing see how happy it is on its chair emile was on the point of laughing at his uncle's kindly attentions to the tomcat but claire who suspected serious designs nudged him with her elbow claire's suspicions were well founded when they had finished supper they resumed the subject of thunder uncle paul began this morning i promised to show you with the cat's help some very curious things the time has come for keeping my word provided puss is agreeable he took the cat whose hair was burning hot and put it on his knees the children drew near jules put out the lamp we must be in the dark the lamp put out uncle paul passed and repassed his hand over the tomcat's back oh oh wonderful the beast's hair is streaming with bright beads little flashes of white light appear crackle and disappear as the hand rubs you would have said that sparks of fireworks were bursting out from the fur all looked on in wonder at the tomcat's splendor that puts the finishing touch here is our cat making fire cried mother ambrosine does that fire burn uncle asked jules the cat does not cry out and you stroke him without being afraid those sparks are not fire replied uncle paul you all remember the stick of sealing wax which after being rubbed on cloth attracts little pieces of straw and paper i told you that electricity aroused by friction is what makes the paper draw to the wax well in rubbing the cat's back with my hand i produce electricity but in greater abundance so much so that it becomes visible where it was at first invisible and bursts forth in sparks if it doesn't burn let me try pleaded jules jules passed his hand over the cat's fur the bright bees and their cracklings began again still stronger emile and claire did the same mother ambroisine was afraid the worthy woman perhaps saw some witchcraft in the bright sparkles from her cat the cat was then let loose besides the experiment was beginning to give annoyance and if uncle paul had not held the animal fast perhaps it would have begun to scratch End of the experiment with the cat by jean henri favre Tao, in its transcendental aspect and in its physical manifestation by lao tzu translated from the chinese by lionel giles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the Tao, which can be expressed in words is not the eternal Tao the name which can be uttered is not its eternal name without a name it is the beginning of heaven and earth with a name it is the mother of all things only one who is ever free from desire can apprehend its spiritual essence he who is ever a slave to desire can see no more than its outer fringe these two things the spiritual and the material though we call them by different names and their origin are one and the same this sameness is a mystery the mystery of mysteries it is the gate of all wonders how unfathomable is tao it seems to be the ancestral progenitor of all things 
how pure and clear is Tao! it would seem to be everlasting i know not of whom it is the offspring it appears to have been anterior to any sovereign power Tao eludes the sense of sight and is therefore called colorless it eludes the sense of hearing and is therefore called soundless it eludes the sense of touch and is therefore called incorporeal these three qualities cannot be apprehended and hence they may be blended into unity its upper part is not bright and its lower part is not obscure ceaseless in action it cannot be named but returns again to nothingness we may call it the form of the formless the image of the imageless the fleeting and the indeterminable would you go before it you cannot see its face would you go behind it you cannot see its back the mightiest manifestations of active force flow solely from tao tao in itself is vague impalpable how impalpable how vague yet within it there is form how vague how impalpable yet within it there is substance how profound how obscure yet within it there is a vital principle this principle is the quintessence of reality and out of it comes truth from of old until now its name has never passed away it watches over the beginning of all things how do i know this about the beginning of things through tao there is something chaotic yet complete which existed before heaven and earth oh how still it is and formless standing alone without changing reaching everywhere without suffering harm it must be regarded as the mother of the universe its name i know not to designate it i call it tao endeavoring to describe it i call it great being great it passes on passing on it becomes remote having become remote it returns therefore tao is great heaven is great earth is great and the sovereign also is great in the universe there are four powers of which the sovereign is one man takes his law from the earth the earth takes its law from heaven heaven takes its law from tao but the law of tao is its own spontaneity tao in its unchanging aspect has no name small though it be in its primordial simplicity mankind dare not claim its service could princes and kings hold and keep it all creation would spontaneously pay homage heaven and earth would unite in sending down sweet dew and the people would be righteous unbidden and of their own accord as soon as tao creates order it becomes nameable when it once has a name men will know how to rest in it knowing how to rest in it they will run no risk of harm tao as it exists in the world is like the great rivers and seas which receive the streams from the valleys all pervading is the great tao it can be at once on the right hand and on the left all things depend on it for life and it rejects them not its task accomplished it takes no credit it loves and nourishes all things but does not act as master it is ever free from desire we may call it small all things return to it yet it does not act as master we may call it great the whole world will flock to him who holds the mighty form of tao they will come and receive no hurt but find rest peace and tranquillity with music and dainties we may detain the passing guest but if we open our mouths to speak of tao he finds it tasteless and insipid not visible to the sight not audible to the ear in its use it is inexhaustible retrogression is the movement of tao weakness is the character of tao all things under heaven are products of being but being itself is the product of not being tao is a great square with no angles a great vessel which takes long to complete a great sound which cannot be heard a great image with no form tao lies hid and cannot be named yet it has the power of transmuting and perfecting all things 
Tao produced unity. Unity produced duality. Duality produced trinity. And trinity produced all existing objects. These myriad objects leave darkness behind them and embrace the light, being harmonized by contact with the vital force. Tao produces all things. Its virtue nourishes them. Each is formed according to its nature. Each is perfected according to its strength. Hence, there is not a single thing but pays homage to Tao and extols its virtue. This homage paid to Tao, this extolling of its virtue, is due to no command, but is always spontaneous. Thus it is that Tao, engendering all things, nourishes them, develops them, and fosters them, perfects them, ripens them, tends them, and protects them. Production without possession, action without self-assertion, development without domination. This is its mysterious operation. The world has a first cause, which may be regarded as the mother of the world. When one has found the mother, one can know the child. Knowing the child and still keeping the mother, to the end of his days he shall suffer no harm. It is the way of heaven not to strive, and yet it knows how to overcome. Not to speak, and yet it knows how to obtain a response. It calls not, and things come of themselves. It is slow to move, but excellent in its designs. Heaven's net is vast. Though its meshes are wide, it lets nothing slip through. The way of heaven is like the drawing of a bow. It brings down what is high and raises what is low. It is the way of heaven to take from those who have too much and give to those who have too little. But the way of man is not so. He takes away from those who have too little to add to his own superabundance. What man is there that can take of his own superabundance and give it to mankind? Only he who possesses Tao. The Tao of heaven has no favorites. It gives to all good men without distinction. Things wax strong and then decay. This is the contrary of Tao. What is contrary to Tao soon perishes. End of Tao in its Transcendental Aspect and in its Physical Manifestation by Lao Tzu, translated from the Chinese by Lionel Giles, read by Nemo. Unman Not Thyself by Sir Thomas Brown 1605 to 1682 from christian morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org live unto the dignity of thy nature and leave it not disputable at last whether thou hast been a man or since thou art a composition of man and beast how thou hast predominantly passed thy days to state the denomination unman not therefore thyself by a bestial transformation nor realize old fables expose not thyself by four-footed manners unto monstrous draughts and caricature representations think not after the old pythagorean conceit what beast thou mayst be after death be not under any brutal metempsychosis while you livest and walkest about erectly under the scheme of man in thine own circumference as in that of the earth let the rational horizon be larger than the sensible and the circle of reason than of sense let the divine part be upward and the region of beast below otherwise tis but to live invertedly and wish thy head unto the heels of thy antipodes desert not thy title to a divine particle and union with invisibles let true knowledge and virtue tell the lower world thou art a part of the higher let thy thoughts be of things which have not entered into the hearts of beasts think of things long past and long to come 
acquaint thyself with the corrigium of the stars and consider the vast expansion beyond them let intellectual tubes give thee a glance of things which visible organs reach not have a glimpse of incomprehensibles and thoughts of things which thoughts but tenderly touch lodge immaterials in thy head ascend unto invisibles fill thy spirit with spirituals with the mysteries of faith the magnality of religion and thy life with the honour of god without which though giants in wealth and dignity we are but dwarfs and pygmies in humanity and may hold a pitiful rank in that triple division of mankind into heroes men and beasts for though human souls are said to be equal yet is there no small inequality in their operations some maintain the allowable station of men many are far below it and some have been so divine as to approach the apogeum of their natures and to be in the confinium of spirits behold thyself by inward optics and the crystalline of thy soul strange it is that in the most perfect sense there should be so many fallacies that we are fain to make a doctrine and often to see by art but the greatest imperfection is in our inward sight that is to be ghosts unto our own eyes and while we are so sharp-eyed as to look through others to be invisible unto ourselves for the inward eyes are more fallacious than the outward the vices we scoff at in others laugh at us in ourselves avarice pride falsehood lie undiscerned and blindly in us even to the age of blindness and therefore to see ourselves interiorly we are fain to borrow other men's eyes wherein true friends are good informers and censurers no bad friends conscience only that can see without light sits in the areopagi and dark tribunal of our hearts surveying our thoughts and condemning our obliquities happy is that state of vision that can see without light though all should look as before the creation when there was not an eye to see or light to actuate a vision wherein notwithstanding obscurity is only imaginable respectively unto eyes for unto god there was none eternal light was ever created light was for the creation not himself and as he saw before the sun may still also see without it in the city of the new jerusalem there is neither sun nor moon where glorified eyes must see by the archetypal sun or the light of god able to illuminate intellectual eyes and make unknown visions intuitive perceptions in spiritual beings may perhaps hold some analogy unto vision but yet how they see us or one another what eye what light or what perception is required unto their intuition is yet dark unto our apprehension and even how they see god or how unto our glorified eyes the beatific vision will be celebrated another world must tell us when perceptions will be new and we may hope to behold invisibles End of on man not thyself by sir thomas brown sixteen hundred and five to sixteen hundred and eighty two from christian morals